I'm Didalini Dantana. A lecturer and a clinical audiologist with the Department of Disability Studies Faculty of Medicine of the University of California, Sri Lanka. So I would like to welcome you all for the audiology webinar for the month of May, organized by the audiology team of the Department of Disability Studies of the Faculty of Medicine, University of California, Sri Lanka. So this webinar has organized as a continuous professional development program for hearing healthcare professionals. The resource person for today's webinar is Prof. Prashant Prabhu. He is currently working as an assistant professor in audiology at the All India Institute of Speech and Hearing, Mysore. His research areas have focused on assessment and rehabilitation of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, tinnitus, auditory processing disorders, and hidden hearing loss. He has published more than 60 articles as an author or co-author in many reputed peer-reviewed national and international journals. He's currently serving as an academic editor for the prestigious PLOS One journal. He has authored book chapters, served as a reviewer for several reputed international journals, and he served as a resource person at several workshops, seminars, and conferences at national and international level. So Prof. Prashant Prabhu is the guest speaker of this session today and he will be discussing on audiological assessment and management of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, along with recent research findings. At the end of this session, there will be a question and answer session. So now I would like to kindly invite Prof. Prashant to start the session, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Over to you, Prof. Prashant. Yeah, thank you so much, so thank you for inviting me to be a part of uh, this program. And uh, I hope uh, this 90 minutes that we'll be spending would be useful and we'll learn uh, something uh, together. Okay, so I'll just switch off my, my video so that the network is better. And I'll start sharing my screen. So is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay, so, so the topic that we would be discussing is, uh, as explained, audiological assessment and management of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder uh, with research uh, evidences. Uh, I've been working on auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder for past 12 years and my uh, PhD was also on ANST. So I will try to share my experience as much as possible with ANST and uh, try to provide you what are the recent advances that are the ANST better. Okay, so and Looking at the audience, uh, I see many uh, people from Sri Lanka and also from India. I see many students also in the audience. So, uh, considering the, uh, I mean the audience uh, diversity, I have to, I will try to keep it uh, not very complex and not very simple. I'll try to balance such that even an undergraduate student should also be able to get something out of the uh, presentation. And uh, those who are uh, seen my presentation, those who are used to my presentation, I try to keep it more semi-formal as in like not a formal presentation so that uh, it becomes more enjoyable to learn and uh, that's how we learn better when it is not so formal. Okay, so uh, hope, hopefully it will be interesting and useful to all of you and thank you for joining in because it's uh, early uh, 9, 9, 10 as of now. So all of you have joined in and looking forward for the lectures. Hope uh, uh, I'll give justice for that. Okay, so quickly, the agenda for today, what we'll be discussing is, we'll quickly start off with what is auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder in brief, and why a person can get an auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, and how do we assess? So the next part would be the assessment part, how do we find out that a person has ANSD? So, and what are the advancements with respect to the assessment that, are, that have been done and what we need to do extra? 
And then after assessment, what next? The next, I mean, the second half would include the management option. <clears throat> what are the uh, different management options that are available for uh, uh, individuals with ANST? And uh, summary with some clinical and research insights, uh, we would be ending with that. And I use this slide often, and some of my students would know this slide. So this is a, I'll start off with the research evidence. So it means that the level of performance of a student drops drastically after 15 to 20 minutes. So, and after 30 minutes, it goes a blank. So I don't want to speak for one hour with you. Okay, so the, how it would work is, I would speak for 20 to 25 minutes, and there would be a short break uh, where you just, uh, recoup and understand what you have done, uh, what, you have, what you have learned, and then we'll come back for the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes. So that's what we'll be doing. And we'll keep the remaining uh, 15 to 20 minutes for the discussion. I think you will have lots of questions to ask and we'll uh, discuss more on that. So that's how it's gonna work. So ANST is one problem where people listen, but they cannot understand. So this is something, a uh, very difficult condition to handle and uh, individuals with ANST, we get a lot of patients, but still, as audiologists, we are still don't know what exactly needs to be done. What is a perfect solution for an individual with ANSD? So still the hope and search is going on. So we'll try to discuss what is currently available. So to quickly explain what is auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. So all of us hear the sound from the outer ear, it goes to the middle ear, goes to the inner ear, and through the nerve, it goes to the cortex. So where exactly is the problem is, we call auditory neuropathy as retro outer hair cell dysfunction or retro OHC dysfunction. That is problem starts after the outer hair cell. That is after your cochlea, where you have your outer hair cells end, then you have your inner hair cells and the auditory nerve. So the problem will be somewhere in the inner hair cell, the synapse or in the auditory nerve. Okay, so the problem can be in the in a hair cell, synapse, or in the auditory nerve. So that is what is auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. Till your cochlea, it is normal. Or till your outer hair cell, it is normal. Beyond your outer hair cell, there would be some abnormality. Usually the problem would be in the IHC synapse or in the auditory nerve. So that's what is auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. So how do we uh, define it? I mean, one of the uh, simple definition is where you have your autoacoustic emissions normal because you are Outer hair cells are normal because of that you have normal autoacoustic emissions or cochlear microphonics, but you have an abnormal or an absent ABR because ABR comes from your auditory nerve. So if you have presence of OE, absence of ABR, that is your brainstem responses are absent, but your cochlear responses are intact, then we suspect and diagnose an individual as having auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. That's why it's a retrocochlear disorder in which cochlear amplification is not affected, but the transmission in the auditory neural pathway is affected. So that's what is ANST. So when was it first identified? It's a pretty recent disorder, as I said. So when was it identified and who identified it? Okay, so uh, I have a uh, different way of uh, remembering the names of the authors. Some of you might have aware of it. So I'll show you a picture and you need to answer. One second. Okay, so what is common between these two people? So you can just type in your responses in the chat box. So what is common between these two people? Since it's a talk related to Sri Lanka, I have added a Sri Lankan touch to it. So it's a famous all-rounder all from Sri Lanka and a famous actor. So what is common between those two? Any guess? Both are male, okay. Good, what, what's the name? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's with respect to the name. They share a common name. Yes, so that is Arnold. Yes, so that is Arnold Schwarzenegger and that is Russell Arnold. Okay, so Arnold is the common name. And uh, so what is this? That's a picture of a, you can just type in quickly. Star, yeah, so it is a star. So the INST was first described or identified by Arnold Star. So that's what I just wanted to, all of you to remember in a better way. So Arnold Star identified uh, 
auditory neuropathy in the ear. So when did this event happen? When did Sri Lanka win the World Cup? So in which year was it? Yes. So Sri Lanka won the World Cup in 1996. Yes. So that's the best way to remember. So Sri Lanka won it in 1996. That, that is Arjuna Ranatunga there. And auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder was first described by this person who is called Arnold Starr, and it happened in the year 1996. So, uh, so it's almost you know 25 to 26 years uh, since we have ANSD uh, identified. So, so the research or the effort has been done to uh, you know understand it is from past 25 years. So the first is was discovered by 1996. Then they changed the terminology to dyssynchrony because Neuropathy is we cannot actually see a problem actually by, by an audiologist. So audiologists cannot diagnose as neuropathy. So they people preferred or Berlin check. Berlin decided that we need to use a term called as dyssynchrony. What is dyssynchrony is because of a problem in the auditory nerve, the nerves are not firing synchronously. If I'm saying a word called as speech, the all the I mean nerves responsible for those sounds have to fire together but if it is not happening then the nerves they hear only sa they may not hear the upper uh, part of it so then that is referred to as auditory dyssynchrony the nerve is not firing synchronously so the term dyssynchrony came into picture in 2001 but what do we use commonly now what is accepted is there was a meeting that happened in uh como Lake conference in italy in 2008 where they came up with a idea that it should be called as a spectrum disorder like how you have your autism spectrum disorder and similar lines you have your auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder because it's because it's not restricted only to the nerve it can be in the ihc it can be in the synapse it is more like a spectrum not it's a specific uh, neural disorder so because of that well accepted uh, terminology that we use now is auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder so when does onset uh, ansd start so in Western population, ANSD usually occurs in children. So that's what we have seen majority of the studies. Uh, we see that the children uh, have ANSD who are of below 10 years, okay? But there are some Indian studies that we did and uh, what is reported in India, what we commonly see is, we see more in uh, late onset, that is in the adolescents and adults rather than in children. I mean, we get children out also, but when you compare the proportion, it is more of adolescents and adults. and uh, we still don't know the exact reason why it could be so we made an attempt to check what could be the factors that can uh, that can you know predict maybe a late onset auditory dyssynchrony so one of the reasons that we found was most common was on uh, you know low socioeconomic status most of them were from a very uh, I mean, from a very rural background and without uh, with a so low socioeconomic status. In that context, it, there could be some malnutrition that could be triggering, uh, you know, a, a neuropathy kind of a response. So that is one theory that we thought of. Then it was onset of the puberty. That was a very common thing that we saw. That is. Uh, after the onset of the puberty, especially in females, after their menstrual cycle started, most of them reported of uh, uh, auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. So maybe the hormonal changes is triggering some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, genetic disorder or, uh, I mean, you know, that could be leading to auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. And another thing was exposure to toxic chemicals. So there is a compound called as xylene, which is uh, actually banned, uh, especially in Western countries, etc. But this is something which was commonly used as a fertilizer, even in India, though it was banned. But uh, that could be one of the reasons, because there was one study where xylene could lead to auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. There was a scientist who got exposed to xylene, and he got an auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. In that way, we thought of these could be the possible predisposing factor, but there, definitely there is a genetic uh, involvement, but more studies on this area is essential to identify why maybe we are seeing more late onset auditory dyssynchrony. So, Moving on to why now, why do, it, why do we get ANST? As I said before, it can be a problem in the IHCs or at the synapse or in the auditory nerve fiber where there could be a problem in the demyelination. There could be myelin loss, sheath loss and axonal loss that, could, that can lead to auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. So just to tell you, this is the IHCs. There could be problem in the IHCs. When I say synapse, it's the junction connecting the IHCs and the auditory nerve fiber. And the, I mean, this is the auditory nerve. So there can be problem in any one of the three IHCs, synapse, or in the auditory nerve that can lead to auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. 
So this is a picture where it shows that uh, this is from a auditory neuropathy patient where you clearly see a reduction in the myelin sheet. So because of that, the nerve fibers are not so uh, thickened and all that. So that could be the reason for getting an auditory neuropathy. So what actually happens, it's, there's a dyssynchronous firing. This is the normal firing. The, the group of nerve fibers have to fire synchronously. So then you get a response. This is like your AVR or a compound action potential. If all the nerve fibers are slow, still you get a response, but it is delayed. Okay, it is delayed. If you see here, it is slightly delayed. But what happens in ANST is there is a variable slowing. This nerve fibers fires early, but this fiber fires late. So there is a dyssynchronous firing or they're not firing together. So because of that, the amplitude reduces, or if some nerve fibers are not firing at all, then you may not get any ABR at all. So that's what happens in individuals with ANST. The nerves are not firing synchronously. That's why the person is not able to, they may be hearing because this nerve fiber may fire one time, but they're not firing it together because of that, they fail to understand uh, what is the information that they are hearing. So, but if I do an MRI or, so I get normal results. I, I won't be able to see any, uh, any problem. Everything comes out to be normal, but they'll have a retrocochlear pathology. So to quickly move on to the characteristics of ANST, if I do an audiological evaluation, what are the characteristics that I can get? Degree of hearing loss, it can range from normal to profound. We commonly see the range can go from normal to even profound. Usually it is symmetrical, but rarely it is asymmetrical or unilateral, but mostly it is symmetrical loss. Common type of audiogram that we see is reverse sloping or a peaked audiogram configuration where you have more loss at low frequency, better hearing at mid frequency and slightly more loss at high frequency. And speech perception abilities are out of proportion to their pure tone loss. They have a lesser loss, but the speech identification scores or discrimination scores are very poor. For example, with a mild loss, they get around 0 or 20 percent speech identification score. That is abnormal. They're disproportionate. Uh, speech identification scores is an indication of ANST. Poor results on psychoacoustic tests. If I do some advanced tests like on temporal processing, etc., they get uh, very poor scores. But clinically, I can just do degree of hearing loss. There can be, uh, you know, also inconsistency in responses because the nerve fiber may fire one time and it may not fire later. So because of that, there can be inconsistencies or it can be normal to perform or we can see a peaked kind of or reverse sloping where you have more loss of low frequency, better hearing at mid and slightly higher loss at high frequency. The reason that is given why this, uh, this type of configuration is more common is because of the length of the auditory nerve fibers. The length of the auditory nerve fibers are longest at low frequency and they are shortest at mid frequency and they're in between at the high frequency. Because of that, since the length is more, there is more dyssynchrony because of the length is more there, there are more chances of dyssynchronous firing for low frequencies and temporal coding is important for perception of low frequency. The nerve has to fire because we hear low frequencies through timing cues and that gets affected in individuals with ANS. But in mid frequencies are the shortest because of that we have better hearing and high frequencies somewhere in between. This is the reason we, they say, why do we hear better? Uh, I mean, why do we get this kind of uh, audiogram? What happens if you do emittance? If you, die, you do emittance, you get normal tympanogram, but reflexes would be absent because uh, the nerve is not firing properly because of the afferent pathway that is affected, you get absent reflexes. That's again an indication of ANST because if I have mild loss, I, I would expect a reflexes to be present if it's a cochlear pathology, but absence of reflexes with a normal tympanogram indicates a possible retrocochlear pathology. Autoacoustic emissions present or robust. So that's another important thing that all of us need to remember. Autoacoustic emissions will be present. So if I do OEs and it can be robust, that is you get high amplitude OE somewhere around, you know, a 20 or 25 dB, SN, uh, 25 dB amplitude or an SNR of 20 to 25. So if we can get a high or a robust OEs, the reason that they give for robust OEs are also absence of efferent pathway. I mean, it could be slightly difficult for maybe undergraduate, but efferent pathways where you have inhibition coming from the cortex, that is the outer hair cell movement gets inhibited because of the inhibitory responses. And that is absent in, uh, you know, that is absent in individuals with ANST. So OHCs move more. There is no inhibition for OHCs because of that you get a robust autoacoustic emission. The same applies even for uh, cochlear microphonics. So cochlear microphonics is another thing that you can get in ABR itself or when you do you mean electrocochleography or ECOG, but there can be a long ringing cochlear microphonics. The cochlear microphonics can be long ringing and the reason can also be the, uh, you know, uh, 
the absence of inhibition because out cochlear microphonics again comes from the outer hair cell because outer hair cells are moving more uh, because of lack of inhibition you may see a long ringing cochlear microphonics this could this is one of the picture from our department where this is a clear cochlear microphonics if you do it in rarefaction and condensation the polarity reverses and that's how we identify that the person is having cochlear microphonics so how do we diagnose a patient is imagine i did not have oes and i had cochlear microphonics and abr was absent cochlear microphonics present and you can see here abr is absent so then we diagnose a patient as ansd so even in our clinic we were doing this and this this case which i'm showing here was diagnosed as having i mean those two cases were diagnosed as having auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder but they did not have oes because of maybe midlay pathology we were not able to record oes but cm was present abr was absent that is a click of abr was absent so because of that we diagnosed them as ansd but this case did not have ansd so that's when we came up with a paper where we we described that long ringing cochlear microphonics is not unique to auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder it is not something which is unique whenever you see long ringing cochlear microphonics we should not directly go to a judgment that the person is having auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder why because this case was was a very young child when we diagnosed because of that we did not have any behavioral responses once the child uh, was old enough to give a behavioral responses we did audiometry and he showed a steeply sloping hearing loss as in better hearing at low frequencies and he had loss at higher frequencies so when we did tone burst abr on that patient and when we did tone burst abr so tone burst abr was present the so tone burst abr was present at low frequencies and click was absent so if tone burst abr is present then the person cannot have auditory neuropathy because uh, abr would be absent uh, even for tone burst or for click so long ringing cochlear microphonics can also be seen in individuals with a sloping hearing loss or a low frequency hearing loss whenever you have when you have a high frequency hearing loss and better hearing at low frequency that's a sloping hearing loss we can get long ringing cochlear microphonics so that's something which is not unique to ansd so whenever you see cochlear microphonics which is long ringing always do tone burst to come confirm it is not a sloping loss and then only diagnose a patient as ansd that is another important thing that we need to remember and as a clinical protocol we should always be using tone burst along with click for diagnosis and not rely only on click for diagnosing uh, patients with especially ansd and another thing which you can see here here abr is present but still you have cochlear microphonics also present this is also another phenomenon of those people who have high risk factors that is where your uh, cortical system is not so mature maybe though those with uh, uh, you know delayed birth cry and uh, those who have uh, some problem where the cortic i mean they have a slightly developmental delay so what 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 was seen is cochlear microphonics can also be seen in such patient but with a, with age advancement the cochlear microphonics goes off but long ringing cochlear microphonics can also be seen in those with children with high risk factors okay so that's something which we should not get confused and say that the person is having auditory neuropathy so just to quickly summarize oe will be present or robust reflexes will be absent cochlear microphonics will be present but invert with polarities abr absent and we should always do click and tone burst abr just to make sure that uh, you know it is not a sloping hearing loss sis normal to severe in quiet sometimes it doesn't correlate or disproportionate but speech perception in noise uh, is definitely affected so these are uh, traditional clinical tests that you do and based on which you need to diagnose a patient as ans another important aspect that we need to be uh, careful of is how do we differentiate an auditory maturational delay and auditory neuropathy what happens is even if a child has auditory maturation delay okay so i'll answer the question later okay so uh, auditory maturational delay versus auditory neuropathy how do we differentiate that as Or even if a person ha child has an auditory maturation delay oes will be present okay so what happens is oes would be present because the cochlea is usually developed oes will be present but what happens to abrs abr can be abnormal so how do we decide 
whether the child is having auditory maturation delay or auditory neuropathy is in such a case we need to go for a long latency response or an llr okay so llr is something which is important can help us in differentiating between an amd and an auditory neuropathy if llr becomes present okay so i'm just saying llr becomes present which means oes are present abr is absent and llr is present which means a cortical response is present if there is an auditory maturation delay cortical responses would be also absent but if it that is present then i can confidently say that the child is having ansd but if cortical response is also absent we are not very sure so what this is the thing that you need to remember if oe is present and abr is absent and llr is present then it is definitely ansd and not auditory maturation delay and oe is present abr is absent and llr is also absent then we cannot predict because even in ansd llr could be absent even in maturation delay it can be absent so what you need to do is you need to ask for follow ups because if it is auditory maturation delay abr starts to develop when I mean, you will start getting abr at higher levels and then it gradually improves but if it's ansd it will continue to be absent even after follow up for like till maybe 6 months or 9 months maximum uh, if you are not able to see anything at all even at 6 months then you uh, you can diagnose a patient as ansd and not auditory maturation delay so llr is another important tool that we need to start using especially when we have a confusion between uh, or differential diagnose between ansd and uh, auditory maturation delay so again a quick summary uh, so this is regularly what we do clinically but what are the additional things that we need to be uh, careful of especially from a research angle uh, these are the things that we don't do regularly but this is something if we incorporate or if we think of that is important from an assessment point of view is what i'll discuss now so after covid all of us are very familiar with this instrument which is used to uh, check temperature okay so all of us have been used to uh, getting our temperature checked wherever we go uh, so there is a concept that i'll be talking about called as temperature sensitive auditory neuropathy so that is increase in the body temperature can affect or can increase the severity of auditory neuropathy so that's another very interesting study that was done i um, mean way back in uh, uh, 2000 and uh, later it was uh, uh i mean restudied again in 2016 as well this is one of the first study the figure which i'm just showing it to you so this was i mean this picture shows the actual audiogram when the child does not have any fever okay when the child does not have any fever this is the audiogram when you do the audiometry when the child body temperature is 37.8 this is the audiogram that they got but when the body temperature was 38 the loss almost became profound so it's like when the body temperature increased even by like you know uh, 0.5 degree cent uh, celsius so that it was enough to you know increase the uh, increase the threshold okay so th what they found in this patient was abr was uh, like slightly um, abnormal but it was present when the child was afebrile that is not having fever but when the testing was done when the child had fever then the abr completely vanished so the person had almost severe to profound hearing loss so this is extremely important because this is another thing that can happen in auditory neuropathy patient this is another study that was most recent study where they clearly show that you know it was more like a follow up this was at the day of uh, i mean morning the child's body temperature was lesser but in afternoon the temperature increased so when the testing was done in the afternoon the loss became more compared to when the testing was done in the morning so this is this can happen and the reason uh, is this happens in a demyelinating condition this is very common in a demyelinating condition so whenever auditory neuropathy is due to a demyelination this can happen okay so this all of you need to remember this and keep in mind <clears throat> whenever you are testing whenever you are getting absent response and things like that you should always check the ensure that the baby is not febrile because that can uh, lead to mean uh, we know that there is an autoferlin gene that uh, causes auditory neuropathy and autoferlin gene mutation is one of the reason for getting a temperature sensitive auditory neuropathy so why should the loss increase if it's a demyelinating condition is the next question that comes to your mind so this is what happens if it's a myelination axon there's a saltatory uh, spread that happens okay but if it's unmyelinated what happens is there is a slow speed with which 
uh, the, in saltatory is the nerve jumps through the nodes of Ranvier and the sound passes faster. But if it is demyelinated, there is a slow spread. But when the temperature increases in a demyelinated condition, it blocks this sodium channel. If you are seeing here, this is Na plus or the sodium channel. This gets blocked because of that the sound does not get transmitted. But when the temperature reduces or child becomes afebrile, these channels again open up and the transmission starts. So this is something which is uh, which can happen, okay, because you have lots of sodium channels open and that can easily get blocked in an unmyelinated axon. So this is another thing that you need to remember. Okay, another important uh, uh, complaint that we all have is tinnitus. Tinnitus is very common uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, in this era with music induced hearing loss, noise induced hearing loss, etc. So tinnitus is a very common complaint. Tinnitus can also be seen in individuals with ANSD. So that's another important aspect what we usually ignore, mainly seen in adults and adolescents, not so much in children, but in uh, tinnitus is another complaint which we usually ignore. We don't even ask and we don't administer any test for, for tinnitus in individuals with ANSD. So that is something we need to uh, keep doing because uh, what we found in the three studies was, we found that the prevalence was almost you know, 67%. Most of them had tinnitus and we found out the handicap most of them range from moderate to severe degree of handicap most of them said due to the sound i i, I don't understand anything because that's a uh, that's a very uh, uh, I mean, very problematic condition but we don't worry or uh, you know do management for tinnitus aspect so that's another thing that we need to remember and do okay so i'll try to explain if possible how we can do it but we need to manage tinnitus as well and from an assessment angle, we need to assess for uh, tinnitus as well. Okay. One sec. Hmm. So that's what we did. We did a questionnaire based study, and it is definitely an important concern for ANSD. And another thing which is usually ignored is balance. Okay, so balance is another important aspect. So people with ANSD or children with ANSD may also have vestibular problems. So we did few studies where they found out that almost majority of them report of vestibular symptoms, but we don't ask and we don't go in detail because the focus is always on the reduced hearing sensitivity part, not on the uh, vestibular part. So even we did a dizziness handicap inventory and we found that almost it was uh, uh, close to moderate uh, degree of handicap due to giddiness. So that's again an uh, aspect which is usually ignored, which need to be checked. We need to do a vestibular evaluation also on individuals with ANSD and confirm and check if they have any vestibular problems because there have been lots of studies which talk about CVAMP and OVAMP being abnormal and uh, that is something which, is, uh, uh, which can get affected, okay? So always try and ask questions about vestibular problems. If they have, do a vestibular assessment and think of managing or doing things for vestibular management as well. Another aspect usually ignored is the psychological problems in individuals with ANSD. So that's again another aspect because of the social isolation they hear, they're able to hear, but they're not able to understand that so many of them have depression, anxiety, stress, etc. So that is because even as audiology, we cannot do so much for them. So because of that, people go into uh, suicidal tendencies and having lots of uh, stress, etc. So in such patients, we need to refer them for a psychological intervention where they can get some support so that they can manage these aspects as well, along with an audiological management. So this is with respect to the assessment part quickly. So the key points to remember, cochlear microphones is not something which is unique to ANSD. So we need to do a tone burst ABR to confirm it. ANSD versus AMD, we do LLR and based on LLR, we can decide whether it is ANSD or we need to do follow-ups. And we have learned about something called as temperature sensitive auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder as well. Okay, so that's again, temperature can also lead to ANSD. Tinnitus evaluation, all of us usually ignore. That's another thing which we need to take into consideration. Look for vestibular problems, do appropriate assessment and management. Look for psychological problems as well and do an appropriate assessment on those lines as well. Okay, so there's another thing which we need to do is genetic evaluation. That's what is the recent trend with respect to um, with respect to ANST, which is very important and from a management angle. So that's why I'll tell about the importance of genetics in the management aspect, but from an assessment angle, we need to refer patients if possible for the genetic testing too, and that can help us in deciding what could be the best management option for that. 
patient. Okay, so that will come up in the next half. So I've been talking for almost like close to 25 minutes now. So we definitely need a CRT strategic timeout for a while. So we'll take a quick uh, break. I know you all deserve it. So you can just uh, open your WhatsApp uh, statuses. You just see their Instagram stories. You can uh, just do that and uh, relax for some time. Maybe I will quickly uh, start again uh, after a quick break. Okay, so I'll take uh, two minutes voice rest as well, and you also can do that, and we'll uh, come back with the next half. Okay. Okay, so, so without wasting much time, we'll start. But before I start uh, going for the next one, uh, we'll just uh, just to refresh your mind and uh, uh, focus more because management is something where it is more important and there could be slight concepts where, where you need to pay more attention to. Okay, so on... Uh, on that angle, uh, those who are students of mine or those who have attended my lectures, you know about this. So there is a small quiz that we will uh, start off. Okay, so just to uh, just to keep you interested and uh, just to refresh your mind before we go to the management. So that's what we'll do. So I, what I want you to do is just uh, with your phones or with your laptops that you are using, you can uh, click on to um, you know www.menti.com. Okay, so there, there's a small quiz that would happen now where you would be asked to ask questions. There will be a question and there will be four options. You need to just click the correct answer. So whenever, uh, once you click the correct answer, there would be a uh, leaderboard that comes up which shows who has answered it faster and accurately. So there are two things. One is accuracy and one is uh, uh, speed. Okay, so you need to answer it as quickly as possible and as accurately as possible so that you get the uh, top 10 uh, people who uh, win it. So there are just three simple questions based on what we have discussed. Okay, and uh, let's see how much I've understood and let's see uh, who wins the quiz. And just quickly share it. So there would be a code that you need to just open www.menti.com and uh, and a code would come. The code is 68582606. So the code is 68582606. You need to enter that code and uh, you would uh, join in. So let's see, we have people from India, people, we have people from Sri Lanka, we have people from other countries as well. So let's see uh, who wins the quiz. You can just give your names or give your nicknames and uh, let's see who uh, wins the quiz. There are just three simple questions. First one is a general knowledge one and the second, and the next two are based on ANSD. Okay, so we'll quickly do it for three minutes and we'll start at 9.50. Okay. Okay, we have 50 participants, 51, good. So we have around 63. I'll just wait for 55. Once it is done, I think I should start. I think we are close to 50. Yes, all of you have opened menti.com, 68582606. And all of you are here. And um, there will be a question that will be displayed on your screen. They'll have four options. Click on the option which you feel is correct and do it as quickly as possible, okay? So let's go and start. We have 53. First one is a general knowledge one. Which is the capital of Sri Lanka? So first one is general knowledge. So let's see how you... Yes, so 49 of you have got it correct. Definitely it's not Chennai. Okay, it's definitely Colombo. So let's see who are the top 10 people who have answered accurately and also quickly. Uh, 
Okay, so excellent. So we have Ganavi who is fastest and closely followed by Dinukshi when you have Sanjay, Dia, Sunny, Prakriti, Jijinu, Pratik, Preeti and Karthik. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So next one is based on auditory neuropathy and what we have discussed. Okay, so let's see. If you have joined in early, you should be able to answer this. Auditory neuropathy was first described by described auditory neuropathy first. So we have 55 responses. I hopefully yes. So it is Arnold Star and not is not Arnold Moon and Sun. So 45 of you have got it correct. So let's see. Uh, if Ganavi continues or if somebody takes over. Okay, so Ganavi still continues and we have some changes. We have Dia who, has, who is second now followed by Jijinu, Preeti, Dinukshi, etc. Okay, so we'll go to the last one, final one. So let's see who wins the quiz for today. Question number three. It is based on uh, ANST, pathophysiology. which is not a site of lesion in ANST, which is not a site of lesion. Yes, so outer hair cell is not a site of lesion. IHC, synapse, and auditory nerve are site of lesion. So that's what we have discussed. Outer, they will have normal outer hair cells or it's a retro OHC dysfunction is what we have discussed. Okay, so let's see who wins the quiz. So I'm just making you wait so that you have that curiosity. So, okay, then fine. So let's see who wins for today. Okay, so Ganavi wins the quiz for today. So then followed by we have Preeti, Dia, Dinukshi, Jijinu, Ananya, Jay, I don't know who is it, Adlin, uh, Shimola, and yes, HP. So congratulations and uh, uh, thank you for uh, participating in the quiz. So now I hope uh, all of you are fresh and all of you are uh, uh, back to with the concentration mode and then we'll go for the management of ANS. So we'll quickly talk about it for another 25 minutes and then we'll leave for the last 15 minutes for the discussion. Okay. So with respect to management, since it's a sensory neural hearing loss, so the option that comes to our mind is what should be the management option. The first option that comes to our mind is there has to be a hearing aid because they have hearing loss and a sensory neural pathology. We should be giving a hearing aid to them. Okay, so will hearing aids work or will it not work is what we need to discuss. Okay, so we'll discuss about the positives and the negatives. So I'm talking mainly with respect to children and then I'll talk about uh, with respect to adolescents and adults. Most of the studies of my studies are on those lines. So I'll talk about that later. Okay, so hearing aids, there are lots of studies who have talked about uh, hearing aids, but there are arguments for it and against it. Those who are against it, they say that if they use hearing aids, they have normal OEs, OEs will go off. So uh, you, you don't give a hearing aid because OEs would be lost and they won't perform better. But there are other audiologists who say that OEs are gen are not actually helping them. They have normal outer hair cell function, but if it's not helping them, what's the point of just having an OE? Just give them hearing aid according to their degree of loss so that their hearing can get restored and then they can perform better with hearing aids as well. So what do studies say? Will it help or will it not help? So American Academy of Audiology, so they did a study, I mean Walker et al, they did a study in 2016. And they recommended that ANST should undergo a hearing aid trial if thresholds are poorer. If thresholds are poorer, they should go for a hearing aid and they should start wearing a hearing aid. And studies by Ching, Rance, and all of them have shown that ANST patients who are diagnosed early and fitted with an appropriate hearing aid have similar speech and language development like those with cochlear loss. So those like cochlear loss and 
on similar lines, you can, they can also perform. So the first line of approach should be hearing aid because studies suggest that hearing aids may will benefit individuals if they are rehabilitated early and uh, given appropriate management. However, hearing aid may not work in noisy environment, may be useful in quiet, but it, when they grow up and the child, it may not help too much in a noisy environment. And the poor performance may be related to the poor temporal coding that can happen with the hearing aid. So that, so <clears throat> this is one of the most recent study which I could find on hearing aids. Well, it was done by Gordon and Anu Sharma in 2021. What they found was they did basically an EEG based study where they found out whether the cortex is synchronously firing with the use of hearing aid. So that's what they tried to find out. And what they're saying is with hearing aid use, the cortical synchrony is actually reducing. The cortical synchrony is not improving uh, with the hearing aid. And they recommended that majority of the patients are not getting appropriate benefit with the hearing aid because the cortical synchrony may not be appropriate. But there are some people who have a lesser auditory dyssynchrony, not so much of a problem, they are benefiting, but majority of them are not benefiting is what the recent uh, study says. So there are the reasons what they have given is, first thing is if we have to fit a hearing aid, I should know, an, uh, I should know the appropriate thresholds because I'm fitting a very young child where I don't know the actual threshold of the child. So I would be maybe under underfitting or I'm giving under amplification because of that, the hearing aid may not be beneficial. That is one thing. Second, hearing aid may be amplifying an already distorted signal. In the cochlea, there would be an already distorted, I mean, the input itself is distorted. So the hearing aid is actually amplifying a distorted signal and it's not benefiting. And there's a theoretical risk that it may damage the intact cochlea. So these are the reasons that are suggested and say, say that, okay, hearing aids may not be beneficial. Okay, there, is, uh, there are studies for and there are studies against. <clears throat> so if not hearing aids, what next? Then another option is cochlear implant. If hearing aids are not beneficial, then we need to go for a cochlear implant. So those whom you have tried hearing aids and hearing aids is not beneficial, then you can go for a cochlear implant. And those who have higher degree of loss, those who have severe to profound hearing loss, those who know that hearing aid in general won't be beneficial, even if it is cochlear or neural, then you go for a cochlear implant is the uh, notion that they suggest. But problem is in the nerve. I'm saying that the problem is in the auditory nerve, but we are giving a cochlear implant also which stimulates the nerve. How a cochlear implant, which is actually stimulating the auditory nerve, can help a person who is having an auditory nerve problem. So that's a, uh, that's a question that people had and uh, how a cochlear implant works, quickly just telling you for those who, uh, for undergraduate students who may not be knowing it, is like you, you'll have, the microphone will pick up the signal, it will go, it will get converted into an electromagnetic signal and goes and goes to the cochlea where you have kept electrodes where electrical signal, the acoustic signal gets converted directly to the electrical signal and that is stimulated to the auditory nerve. The sound is given directly to the auditory nerve. So what happens there is, how can it improve is, it has thought that cochlear implants can restore synchronous firing. If you are giving a electrical stimulation directly, that may provide more synchrony compared to if you are just giving a, uh, you know, a cochlear implant. We are just giving a acoustic amplification, sorry, uh, where cochlea is converting and changing it to an electrical signal, that may be problematic. But if the electrical signal is directly given, then it can be more synchronous. And animal models have shown increased neural synchrony with electrical stimulation compared to acoustic stimulation. That was the logic where initially people say that go for implant irrespective of where is the site of lesion because electrical stimulation increases the synchrony. But later, people came up with these two concepts, presynaptic and postsynaptic. That is, cochlear implant will be more beneficial if the loss is presynaptic. Presynaptic is where it is at the IHCs or at the synapse, that is, before the auditory nerve. But if the problem is in the auditory nerve, the cochlear implants may not be so much beneficial. So that's, that's what I mean. If it is IHCs and the synapse, the cochlear implant bypasses this entire IHCs and synapse and it stimulates directly the, uh, the spiral ganglion cells that are there in the auditory nerve. So if I have any problem here and here, I get it gets bypassed and it goes to the auditory nerve, which is absolutely normal and hearing aids, I mean, our cochlear implants will be beneficial in such patients. So that's the logic of uh, 
checking presynaptic and postsynaptic lesion. So how do we identify? What do the study say? Can I identify before surgery, whether it is presynaptic or postsynaptic? There are two ways where people recommend. One is this. So this is one study um, done by McMohan et al. in 2008, where they did intra-tympanic ECOG, that is, I repeat, intra-tympanic electrocochleography, where you put a needle electrode and stimulate directly the cochlea and record an electrocochleography where you get cochlear microphonic summating potential and action potential. So these are the three kinds of responses that you can get. This is, let's go to normal first. This is the normal SP and you have your action potential. Okay, this is normal. But in a second condition where you have SP present, but AP is absent. Okay, you have a, a very prolonged summating potential, but action potential is absent here. But here, what you are seeing is, here you have summating potential. Okay, and you have something called, summating potential is there, but it is slightly lesser amplitude. But here you have something called as a dendritic potential. Okay, you have a negativity, which is not action potential, but it's a dendritic potential that is there. Okay, so then, Based on this, we can differentiate whether it's a presynaptic lesion or whether it's a postsynaptic lesion. Okay, so whenever you know you don't have an action potential, where you don't have an action potential being present, in such a case, I can identify and I can say that it is more of a presynaptic lesion. Okay, if there is a summating potential like this, which is prolonged, okay, so because of that, IHCs are not functioning properly. In such a case, I can say that it is mostly or most probably a presynaptic lesion. Okay, and if the action potential is present or a dendritic potential is present, then it could be mostly a postsynaptic lesion. So what is recommended is you do a intra-tympanic electrocochleography and decide whether it's a presynaptic and postsynaptic lesion. That can help you in identifying. And another thing that people do is electrical ABR. I'm just quickly going through. If you want me to explain again, you let me know in the answer, question answer session. Uh, electrical ABR. You can stimulate your uh, cochlea again, intratympanically, uh, through electrical stimulation. And that can also be recorded. You can give it through... Uh, directly or it can be stimulated through cochlear implant after the implant it can be done pre-implant or post-implant so what is recommended is if electrical abr is present okay if electrical abr is present then that's again a possible indicator that okay even after implant the nerve will start firing because if i'm getting an electrical abr which means that electrical stimulation can stimulate the auditory nerve so that's the logic where people do it but eabr Studies wise, they don't recommend doing it uh, uh, pre-implant. Not so many studies are done pre-implant, but post-implant, you just do an EABR and confirm that, okay, uh, cochlear implant is stimulating the auditory nerve and there would be definitely more progress. So people recommend doing, uh, doing it post-implant as well. So the next component that I'll be talking about is with respect to this. So these are genes. Okay, so things that are important from a cochlear implant angle is genes as well. There can be a genetic disorder, which, which is leading to auditory neuropathy, but genetics can also tell us whether the client may get benefit with cochlear implant or not. Because there's a recent study that is done where they have identified the genes, that is, if it is autoferlin gene, it affects the presynaptic inner hair cell. If it is like CAC and AID, and all these genes are presynaptic. So if I do a genetic evaluation and I know that these are the genes that are affected, then I know that it's a presynaptic lesion. And there are studies which show that cochlear implants have good outcome. That is, that is the cochlear implant outcomes are good if it's an autoferlin gene mutation because of which the person or the child has got auditory neuropathy. So if it is like a postsynaptic lesion, then the child or the person may not get so much of benefit. So if it's the, these are the genes that are affected, which are identified to be affecting a spiral ganglion or the auditory neuron. So if I do a genetic evaluation, I can tell us, or it can tell us or it can guide us that these are the, uh, you know, possible genetic conditions where cochlear implant may be more beneficial. Okay, and people are working on improving gene therapy, etc., to uh, correct all this such that that can help. So that is still in the research stage and that may also help.
Okay, so we did a study. I mean, it is under review. We have to publish it. Is uh, where we try to find out what are the factors that can help or combine do it through a systematic review to find out what, whether uh, what are the factors that will predict whether cochlear implants are beneficial or not. One is the age of time of implantation. Earlier the age of implantation, more better it is. Radiological evaluation, you do a radiological evaluation if there are no auditory nerve abnormalities, like a uh, thin auditory nerve or the reduced length of the auditory nerve, then that again is another positive indicator that CI would be beneficial. Genetic testing, okay, so if I uh, do genetic testing, as I said, if the genes are identified, which is more presynaptic, and then definitely that will benefit experience with the hearing aid, okay? So experience with the uh, hearing aid, so that's again, Another important factor, if the child has used hearing aid before, then the child may get more benefit with an implant rather than implanting it directly. These are the studies result that they say. And ECOG evaluation to differentiate pre and post synaptic lesion. And uh, post-surgery AABR, if AABR is present, then the child may get more benefit with the implant. So ultimately, which one should I select? Which should I go for a hearing aid or should I go for a cochlear implant? So in 2019, there was a study done where they quickly, they tell us or give us a guideline on what should be done on how we should manage an individual with ANST. This I find it to be very useful. If you suspect an ANST, do an appropriate diagnosis and confirm. After that, do a hearing aid trial. Okay, give a hearing aid for a trial period and check for the, and start appropriate therapy. And if the child is, getting appropriate auditory skills and there is an improvement in speech and language continue with audiological monitoring okay but if the child is not benefiting then go for a ci in ci if it a child has lesser than severe hearing loss go for a bimodal maybe one side implant another side hearing aid and if the child has bilateral severe then you can go for directly ci and even with this if there is no improvement go for contralateral ci if there is improvement go for a bimodal so this is something which is uh, recommended based on the studies. So if a child child has ANSD, go for a hearing aid and then gradually decide based on the improvement whether you need to go for a CI or not. But if the loss is high, then you can directly go for an implant. And even when you're going for implant, it's recommended that you need to consider all this to uh, predict the prognosis of the child. Other options you can think of, why not auditory brainstem implant? Because we can, we can you know, skip the auditory nerve and in, we can implant uh, or it, uh, brainstem itself. So that's again, people are doing research, but still right now at this stage, uh, it is again, not 100% beneficial. There are some people who are benefiting, but not everyone. So auditory brainstem implant as a management tool, as of now is not uh, I highly recommended, but there are studies that are still going on. People have done studies on FM systems. FM systems, especially individuals with ANST, have difficulty understanding speech in presence of noise. Those who have a lesser degree of loss, uh, you know, in such children or such individuals, they recommend giving an FM hearing aid. So FM technology helps to improve the speech perception in noise, and that can always help them in understanding speech better. So this is briefly with respect to how do we manage children. So I have uh, nine more minutes where I'll quickly cover uh, adolescents and adults with ANSD, what we need to do and what are my studies based on which uh, uh, what results that I could find. So right now, the hearing aids, especially adolescents and adults, what we did was uh, uh, right now the traditional hearing aid fitting, it is not benefiting. So not many people are benefiting with the traditional hearing aid fitting. In such a case, uh, we need to modify. So that's what is the idea came. We need to modify the current hearing aid fitting such that that can help or that can cater to individuals with uh, ANSD specifically. So there have been so many things that have been done. So uh, I'll talk about these four studies. So first study where they modified the attack time and the release time. When we know compression has attack time and release time, having a slow compression attack time and release time helped individuals with ANSD. So that's what their results showed that whenever the attack time was slow, the scores were slightly better. So if you have an option in the hearing aid to set an attack time and release time, try to set it for slow, such that the, the, that the temporal cues are better preserved and that can help individuals with ANSD is the logic. So when I started my thesis, so I thought of whether there is there a need for a selective amplification? Should we do something called as a selective hearing aid amplification? So that 
came up with an idea of low cut modified amplification. Okay, this was based on the study that we did. Uh, we did a study where person SIS was found out, the individuals with the ANSD, and we give only high pass, only the high frequency was passed and the low frequencies was not passed. And the SIS was almost 64%. But when only low frequencies were passed, the, you know, the scores dropped drastically, which meant that whatever SIS they are getting is because of the higher frequencies and they're not using the low frequencies. So because of this logic, we thought that most individuals with ANST have rising audiogram because of that, you know, we give more low frequency gain. So maybe, but there it is over amplifying it. Low frequency may not actually help them because it may lead to upward spread of masking. That is low frequency may mask the uh, high frequency which are relatively intact. So because of that, maybe the people are not getting beneficial. So what we did was we did not give amplification. We got, we were low cut amplification. I mean, we, we did not give amplification as in that we reduced the gain at low frequency and we gave gain only at the higher frequencies in individuals with ANST. And we found that the improvement was slightly better uh, with low cut modified amplification compared to giving hearing aid only uh, with the conventional broadband amplification. And we thought, found that it was better with an RIC hearing aid compared to a BTE because of quality wise, uh, RIC is always better compared to a BTE. So the performance was also better with an RIC in individuals with ANST. And it was better with an open dome. Okay, so an open dome because low frequencies are naturally removed with an open dome compared to a closed dome. So this is what we tried. And uh, we found that low cut with RIC was slightly better compared to conventional RIC and conventional BTE. And another important thing that I just wanted to come tell you all this, this was seen especially in good performer and not in poor performer. That is extremely important. Those who have very poor SIS of less than, you know, 40%, etc. even with all these modifications, they were not getting benefit. So those who had like SIS slightly above 40% with this modification, they found it to be very useful and they accepted the hearing aid better. But if the SIS was poor, that is like those poor performers, they found the found it, you know, uh, even with the hearing aid, uh, with all these modifications, they were still not getting benefit. So, and we also tried channel free hearing aid because with multiple channels, uh, the temporal cues may get affected because of the number of channels gets increased. And because of that, there can be more distortions. Because of that, we did a channel free hearing aid as well. And we found that the channel free performance was better compared to low cut. So this again is important for good performers and poor performers. We found it only in good performers, but in poor performers, again, the channel free and the conventional, there was no, not much, very much significant difference. So that again is important. So if you get a patient with relatively good SIS and rather than conventionally fitting, try fitting a low cut modified amplification, you know, and uh, try giving a RIC with an open dome and that can help them, especially for a good performer and not for a poor performer. So can it, can anything predict whether hearing aids will benefit in individuals with ANST? There are some studies done which they say that LLR, if you do, that can predict if LLR is present in an individual, they get more benefit with uh, hearing aids. So you can do an LLR and that can tell you progress because the synchrony is only at the auditory nerve, not at the cortex. So that's another indicator. Do LLR for hearing aid benefit and do temporal processing tests. That is, if the temporal processing is preserved, okay, they get more benefit with hearing aids. There are studies which show that temp temporal processing are better or closer to normal scores, so then they get uh, better compared to very poor scores, so they may not get benefit with hearing aids. People also did PIPB function. Okay, so we all know how PIPB function works, but when I did PIPB, there are few people, uh, when they did PIPB, there are few people where there was at higher intensity, the scores dropped. Okay, so there were people who had, uh, you know, higher intensity the scores remained the same, but at some people higher intensity scores dropped. But with hearing it, we're amplifying and giving uh, intensity at high, sound at higher intensity, and they may be the people who are not getting benefit. So these are the areas that we need to keep in mind. Do all this and check whether hearing aids will benefit. Cochlear implant, again, not much studies are done on adults and adolescents, but people are still doing it. And they say, again, it is 50, 50 to 60% uh, benefit, but compared to hearing aids, maybe CIs are slightly better. Is uh, what is the current trend as of now? 
so people have also been trying speech reading because okay if i have, if i said that the person has uh, uh, you know uh, poor performer we did everything and nothing is beneficial so what can be done next is at least you need to especially adolescent and adults who have late onset auditory neuropathy in such patients train them for speech reading because they do get benefit with speech training is what the studies say so they suggested that giving auditory plus visual information can help them understand better and irrespective of their hearing loss sis duration of the condition speech reading training can always help them so that's another point that we need to keep in mind so when we are giving auditory verbal therapy or therapy for individuals with ansd should we make any changes or should we do some modifications for especially for children there is nothing specifically uh, we should change for compared to when you are giving therapy for uh, for a cochlear loss per child and a child with ansd but as more intense speech and language stimulation is essential because they are not getting complete information with auditory alone so they may need additional uh, you know multiple cues especially with visual tactile etc with multiple cues they can learn the concept better and they recommend uh, you know giving a clear and natural speech with more temporal cues slightly slower slightly clearer slightly more natural when you speak then the child can perceive better because the temporal cues are more preserved so these are some of the modifications that you can do uh if uh, especially when you are giving a uh, therapy for a child what we have also tried for adolescents and adults is those who are uh, very poor uh, speech understanding ability hearing aids are not beneficial they cannot go for an implant or we are not sure whether their implant will be beneficial what i am trying or what we are trying here is doing training for individuals or adolescents or adults with uh, ansd just like the logic of central auditory processing training how we give therapy for an apd child or an apd adult where we are working on the neuroplasticity of the brain on the same lines we can also give training to improve their temporal processing like your gap detection uh, temporal ordering so the stimuli which we use for uh, assessment we can use it for training as well and help them for improving temporal processing speech perception in noise so uh, give training for improving improving speech understanding ability in presence of noise uh, these these are some of the activities that we are trying and auditory discrimination discriminating low and high and low mid and all that uh, that can also help them so we i have around four to five patients who have benefited with it so we have not yet published the data i am looking for more data for uh, better uh, applicability so this is another thing that we can try till we find out some solution for people who have absolutely uh, very poor uh, speech understanding ability so this is another area which needs to be further explored and this is again i recommend especially for adolescent and adult psych psychological counseling and therapy especially because they need that extra support only then they will be able to face the situation much more better along with that as i said tinnitus and vestibular management if necessary if they have a problem with the tinnitus and vestibular uh, problems okay so summary use of amplification especially for an uh, adult use low time constants and low cut and rc and uh, llr temporal synchrony pipb speech reading this can help and therapy and uh, that is another aspect that we need can explore and try especially in individuals ansd who have a very poor speech understanding ability okay so this is a quick summary of uh, what i just wanted to tell you about what are the management options available as of now based on the literature that in a way as audiologists we can help individuals with ansd so absolutely taken two minutes extra so quickly other research areas to explore we need to do more studies on prevalence in different parts of the world more genetic studies are essential and correlated with the prognosis and all these modifications in adverse listening condition and efficacy of listening training and speech reading therapy in individuals with ansd again needs to be explored further so that we have at least something to offer for individuals with ansd so that's all from my end uh, so let's so uh, hope it was useful and let's open now we'll spend another 15 minutes for uh, discussion and related any doubts or queries that you want you want to ask me okay uh, thank you very much prof prashant for an informative session today uh, i actually quickly drop down uh, some of the questions uh, i mean all the questions sent by uh, different participants so uh, may i start uh, starting with those questions is that okay Yeah, yeah, you can start. Yeah. yeah so uh, there's a question about uh, IHCs and synapses. So the question is about 
If the pathology is at the level of IHC or SYNAP, will there be temperature sensitivity? Yeah, so uh, temperature sensitivity, as of now, what it says is it's more of a demyelinating conditions. If the problem is in the IHCs or in the uh, auditory nerve, uh, uh, IHC is on the synapse, you may not see a temperature sensitive auditory neuropathy. It's more at the auditory nerve. When you have a demyelinating condition, then you will have uh, auditory. I mean, then you have temperature sensitive agents. All right. So the next question is about how long can cochlear microphonic be in the long ringing microphonics? Yeah. So cochlear microphonics, when we say long, usually the normal cochlear microphonics is just within one millisecond. It will be within one millisecond. But if it goes beyond one, when we call it as long ringing. Generally, it is still around three millisecond, but uh, clinically we have seen cochlear microphonics ringing till five millisecond as well. So that's why we recommend that we need to uh, do, you know, uh, alternate record al with alternating just to take off the cochlear microphone and check for uh, neural pathology being present or absent. Okay, so um, the next question is about arterial fibers again. So the question is about uh, it's about uh, about the mid frequency auditory nerve fibers, and you said that they are shorter. So one participant is asked the reason that why mid frequency auditory nerve fibers are shorter. Okay, so I mean that is uh, anatomically that's how we are. Uh, uh, you know, born with, to be honest. So that's how our anatomy works like. So you have your low frequencies longest and mid frequencies are the shortest. Uh, I don't see any uh, physiological explanation for it, uh, but uh, it is the length at which the connection happens. You know, the connection from your uh, cochlea to the nerve, the, the uh, length, it could be uh, due to the distance with respect to the apex and the, uh, how it how it is shaped. It could be because of that, but we are born with that because of that the length is uh, slightly longer for uh, low frequencies and the shortest for the mid frequencies. Yeah. So um, the next question is about differential diagnosis. So the question is about uh, how to differentially diagnose hidden hearing loss, uh, cochlea synaptopathy, and ANSD? Okay, so that's a good question. So people, they are talking about a lot of about hair, hidden hearing loss, where we say that the ribbon synapse at the, uh, you know, um, connecting the IHCs are also affected. And how do we differentiate uh, hidden hearing loss from an auditory neuropathy is, uh, hidden hearing loss is, uh, people can call it as like a continuum, but uh, uh, hidden hearing loss is a lesion where in the synapse is only affected, which means it is affecting the speech understanding ability, but we cannot term them as having auditory neuropathy as such, okay? So uh, it comes under the overall spectrum, but if I'm judging in terms of the severity, hidden hearing loss is something which is of a very minimal understanding problem where the uh, synapse is starting to get affected, okay? But it may not affect so much it's to cause maybe an auditory neuropathy where it's severely, uh, uh, I mean, it is severely affecting. So uh, I would say hidden hearing loss comes under the continuum of uh, auditory neuropathy, I mean, a spectrum disorder, uh, but it's at the earlier stage where the synapse is slightly gotten affected, that's all. But uh, rest everything won't be, I mean, it won't be so severe like an auditory neuropathy. So people are still very not confident whether to include it as a auditory neuropathy continuum or use it as a separate entity. Right now it has always been used as a separate entity where people use synaptopathy separate, separately and uh, see auditory neuropathy separately. But from my judgment, it is also like a, uh, you know, very, very minor form of auditory neuropathy is what I feel. Yeah. So the next question is about uh, the role of ECOG G in differentiating pre versus post synaptic lesions. So the part participant is asked about uh, whether Prof. Prashant can explain about the role of ECOG G to differentiate pre versus post synaptic lesions. Okay. So 
I mean, the pre versus post, how do we use it with ECOG is basically, um, if you have your summating potential, okay, so summating potential is the one which we use, okay, and the action potential, you need to look at both summating potential and the action potential, okay, so if you have your action potential slightly intact, okay, if you have your action potential intact, then it is mostly a presynaptic lesion because action potential comes from the nerve, so it has to be a presynaptic lesion or when the summating potential is affected, Summating potential comes from the IHCs. If that is affected and the action potential is intact, then we call it as a presynaptic lesion. But if your SP is normal, okay, and your AP is affected, okay, if you have SP normal and AP is affected, you're not able to see AP, but you're seeing something like a dendritic potential and only SP, then it's a postsynaptic lesion. So based on doing a transtympanic epoch, we can differentiate whether it's a presynaptic or a postsynaptic lesion. All right. So the next question is about, uh, this is about something uh, relevant to the referrals with respect to mm -hmm. ANSD. So the question is about how important it is for an audiologist to refer clients with ANSD or RCP to neurologist. Yeah. So it's an, ex uh, it is very important for us to uh, refer them for a a neurologist because uh, a neurologist need to differentially diagnose maybe an acoustic neuroma and auditory neuropathy as well because even if i have an acoustic neuroma the, the my OEs will be present and abr will be abnormal so that's again another condition but the features could be slightly different but just to be safer just to ensure that there is no organic pathology it is always better before we diagnose any patient as auditory neuropathy that refer them for a neurologist just to you know uh, rule out uh, rule out a space occupying lesion such as a neuroma and uh, people also do nerve conduction velocity studies where we can find out whether it is actually neuropathy or not so that can be done by a neurologist who can confirm auditory neuropathy so, okay so that's uh, so it is recommended that you can send them for a neurological consultation just to rule out if there is any space occupying lesion Okay, the next question is about uh, the rehabilitation options that you talked about. Uh, the question is about if the hearing aid is not benefiting uh, for a child with ANSD, uh, is, it, is that fine to go for a cochlear implant irrespective of the degree of hearing loss? Yeah, so that's again a bit tricky to answer, but uh, right now, there is no specific candidacy criteria for individuals with ANSD. So as you like, for cochlear hearing loss, we know that if the loss is like more than 60, 70, you can go for an implant. But if the loss is slightly lesser, we are still not sure whether to go for an implant or not. But uh, from a practical experience, what is recommended is if hearing aid is not beneficial at all, and you have done some tests which is suggestive that, okay, cochlear implant may help, then, Going for an implant doesn't harm because we have one patient who had even moderate or closer to moderately severe who was implanted with an auditory neuropathy and the child is doing uh, pretty well. So even if the child has a lesser degree of loss uh, and the hearing aid is not at all beneficial, then going for an implant is, uh, is possible. And again, it depends on the uh, surgeon and all that, but it can be done because the, uh, definitely the improvement would, could be much more better with an implant compared to a hearing aid. Yeah, so uh, so I actually uh, collate all the questions and come up with uh, the common uh, themes. So for the last question, it's about uh, it's a, it's again about the diagnosis of ANSD. So the question is about in case of uh, severe auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder where OAs are absent, uh, how could we make the diagnosis that the patient is having ANSD or not? Okay, so severe hearing loss and OEs are absent, absent. is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Okay, so okay, so so that's uh, that's an audiological uh, difficulty at that case. So how do we diagnose or how what we need to do is 
uh, OE can get absent with time, a person with uh, in such a case, what what we recommend, preferably an extra tympanic or an intra tympanic if possible. The intra tympanic requires a, a, main, a, main, a medical team and all that, but at least an extra tympanic if possible and look for a cochlear microphone. Okay, if you are getting a cochlear microphonic, then you can diagnose a patient as having a auditory neuropathy. So that is uh, um, one way. So because even if your OEs are absent, then you can still get cochlear microphonics because cochlear microphonics is more of an electrical response, but OEs could be absent due to middle pathology or might have been lost uh, due to a uh, bit of long-standing ANST, but cochlear microphonics may still be present. So you make an attempt to get a cochlear microphonics if possible, and based on that, you, then you decide whether it is auditory neuropathy or not. All right, uh, so this is the end of today's session. Uh, I hope that I uh, asked most of the questions that has been uh, provided by participants. So I would like to take this opportunity to, uh, to give my uh, thanks to uh, Professor Prashant Prabhu. Uh, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, having this uh, continuous professional development webinar for the month of May. Uh, and um, I'm going to uh, express my sincere gratitude to you on behalf of the audiology team of the Department of Disability Studies of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. And I would like to express my uh, uh, gratitude to all the participants who participate for this webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Prashant once again. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And uh, it was a very uh, interactive session with so many questions and all of you uh, interacted. And I uh, hope uh, uh, this uh, this has helped you to understand ANSD better. And all of us together can join hands and do more research and uh, help more people with ANSD. So thank you, everyone. So thank you for joining and thank you for the invitation. Thank you.